The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud, a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground. They were overcome by fear. But Jesus came, and he touched them, saying, Get up. Do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, tell no one about this vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Through the words of this Gospel, may our sins be wiped away. When I was a boy, my world consisted of two things, hockey and Spider-Man. Hockey I'd play any time, all the time if I could. Spider-Man I would watch on Saturday mornings. And the thing that drew me to watch Spider-Man was this sacrificial life. He was always helping others who were in trouble. And they were great boyhood memories. I'd call them knuckles and chuckles. But they had a serious side, too. While Spider-Man saved the citizens of New York City, young Peter Parker, the real Spider-Man, he lived a lonely life, and it was an often misunderstood life. His family, his friends, his teacher, they knew nothing of his crime fighting, and they were pretty hard on him, mistaking his exhaustion as laziness, his inexplicable absences as irresponsible, and his constant mental preoccupation as just absent-minded. And how I longed as a boy for the day when the citizens of New York and those who were close to Peter Parker would wake up and recognize who Spider-Man really was. I feel the same incredulity about the transfiguration. People only knew who Jesus really was. Then they would honor him. They would revere him. They would love him. It was a warm Galilean day when the Son of God climbed Mount Tabor with his friends, Peter, James, and John. Why them? For what they would become. Peter is our first pontiff. James was the leader in the church in Jerusalem. John, the gospel writer, and the one that Jesus entrusted his mother to. When they reached the summit, that's when the unexpected thing happened. Now, to be sure, a lot of unexpected things happened as they followed Jesus. You know, there's raging storms that were quelled. There was money changers that were overturned. There was loaves and fishes that were multiplied. Demons evicted. Water changed into wine. But this, well, this was unique even for Jesus, 
Before their terror-stricken eyes, his face became brighter than the sun, his clothes gleaming white, and a voice thundered. It was only for a moment, but he was changed. He transformed. He transfigured. He was translated. The man Jesus, matted hair, Unkempt beard, calloused carpenter hands and dusty feet. Given to hunger and needful of rest, just like the rest of us, was momentarily revealed in divine radiance. But it wasn't our Lord's only transfiguration. There was another Even as we affirm his transfiguration on Mount Tabor, we recognize his transfiguration at his birth. In a manger in Bethlehem, God descends. He becomes one of us. It's a whole lot less striking than Mount Tabor, but it's no less miraculous in its proportions. Jesus enters into our human estate. He remains with us for 33 short years, 12,000 brief days, 290,000 condensed hours. The Logos of God transfigures himself into a baby. The baby grows to become a man. The man lives, dies, rises, and then returns to where he had come from. And even as we speak, Here, and worship, in this moment, the Lord of the manger, as well as the mountain, resides at the right hand of God the Father. In fact, along with the splendor of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost, they reside together in that same brilliance, that very same brilliance that was witnessed on Mount Tabor this day. So, amen, amen, I say to you. And yet, for all of this goodness and all of this splendor, there's one question that remains. What did we gain? What did the transfiguration gain for us? Two simple graces were gained in the transfiguration. The first grace was for the disciples. In watching his transfiguration, they received grace, which would later give them strength. As the passion drew near, they would remember Mount Tabor, remember who Jesus really was. As they took the gospel message to the four corners of the world, they would remember who Jesus really is. And the second grace, it's for us. Like the disciples, we too face hardships. I have no idea what tomorrow will bring. I hope for good. I look for good. But I just don't know. Nor do I have any idea of the week that you've come from. Or the struggles that you face, whether small or large, anxious or distressing, annoying or debilitating, despairing or grief strickening. The point, the point is this, the events on Mount Tabor reveal who Jesus is. He is Lord and he is God and as such he is infinitely powerful and infinitely trustworthy. We embrace him fully and we do not underestimate him. Whatever may come tomorrow or the next day after that or the next week or the next year, he will lead you through safely to the end. 
How do I know this? Because his presence is here with us today too. The Christ of the manger, the Christ of the mountain, is transfigured a third time and made present. Christ on the altar. On every Catholic altar. So faithful of Holy Redeemer. Lift the Lord out of the manger in his first transfiguration. Raise him to the mountain in his second transfiguration and receive him in the Eucharist in his third transfiguration and let him be God for you and in you.